I'm going to go ahead and uh, get the next presentation up. Now, the next presentation is given by an individual that I've known for a bit, and I want to I want to get this right. I'm I'm writing these things down because I really want to get these things right. It's important what people uh, understand about themselves and what wh where their where their place is. Our first presentation is titled "Best Practices in Insider Threat Management," presented by Randy Treziak. And Randy recently and very deservedly became the technical manager of CERT's Enterprise Threat and Vulnerability Management Team and the CERT Insider Threat uh, Center at Carnegie Mellon. And he's also a co-author of the CERT Guide to the Insider Threat. Uh, Paul Loswitz and I had uh, a, a fun time working with, with uh, Randy recently, and his presentation uh, is, let's see here. Best Practices in Insider Threat Management. And I could have read it on the slide here, Randy. Go ahead and come on up here. Uh, let's get this a lot worse. Let me see. There it is. All right. <coughs> Top button's a red pointer if you'd like it. Okay. Thank Great. you, Randy. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here and share some of the work that we've been doing over a number of years. Again, my name is Randy Trezak. Uh, I do work at Carnegie Mellon University as part of the CERT program, and I certainly appreciate the introduction as the new director of the Insider Threat Center. I know a number of you have worked with uh, Ms. Dawn Capelli over the years, uh, who was the previous director of the Insider Threat Center. I've worked with her for a number of years, going back to about 13 years specifically the last seven or so, looking at the insider threat and the problems and the threats they pose to organizations' critical assets. So it certainly is a privilege to be here, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to share what we're doing. Uh, as we started the day by saying, let's make this a discussion. I don't want to talk at you. Let's talk with you and really raise awareness of the insider threat issues that are out there. Again, the understanding of insider threats, I do feel that we have a pretty decent understanding of what the insider threat looks like. We've produced a number of reports that describe what the insider threats and they are to critical assets. <clears throat> and what we want to really want to try to do is move from the identification of the threats to the mitigation of the insider threats. So from a standpoint of this particular presentation, I do want to get into a very quick overview of what the insider threat looks like and then get into some of the strategies for mitigation. So in terms of CERT program, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the CERT program, it is part of Carnegie Mellon University's Software Engineering Institute. The SEI has been around for about 25 years, really designed to develop to help the federal government research tough problems in the area of software security. For the past 20 plus years, the CERT program was stood up to really complement the software research side to provide the cybersecurity research and provide insights into both the holistic picture of what the software security issues are as well as the cybersecurity issues. So we are a federally funded research and development center. Our goal is to do research, transition that out into the community, and our charter as an FFRDC says that we can't compete with industry, we can't compete with government. So I'm not here to sell you anything in terms of a tool or a technology, but what our charter is is to do research into the tough cybersecurity issues and provide guidance in terms of what those threats look like and then hopefully assist with some of the mitigation strategies. So I'm actually located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and we actually do have an office in Arlington, Virginia. So specifically the Insider Threat Center, and we've been doing research into the insider threat since about 2001, really looking at the threat posed by insiders to critical assets. And what we want to try to do is to do empirical research, look at actual data to try to identify if there are patterns that organizations could observe both technical and non-technical patterns. And what we want to try to do is transition that out to organizations to give them something to look for, something to look at. And what we want to try to do is to develop things that we call observables, which we want to transition into indicators that organizations could observe on their networks. And we really try to differentiate between observables and indicators. Because I can't tell you right now with, with, with any degree of confidence that if this happens, this person will go on to disrupt a critical system, to seal some type of data, or to defraud your organization. I don't have that silver bullet of an indicator, but what I can give to you is a list of observables that if seen within your network or within your organization, 
might indicate that someone is a higher risk at doing something bad to your organizations and systems. So again, we try to differentiate between what we call observables and what we call indicators. And then by combining observables together, that should contribute to your enterprise-wide risk profile that you do across your entire organization. So our goal is to research the problem. To date, we've analyzed about 850 actual insider threat incidents, looked for patterns, and we've produced a number of reports. So at the end, I'll give you the link to our website. Lots of information is publicly available about what we think is the insider threat problem and then what you might be able to do to mitigate the insider threat problem. So again, we've analyzed about 850 incidents. We're fortunate, given that we're CERT, that we do actually have liaisons from the Secret Service and FBI embedded into our organizations. So that gives us a lot more data into the investigations, gives us some information into the forensics about incidents, and it's, it's a great position to be to collect data. And our goal is to be able to share some of that data. So if you're interested, we do have opportunities to share some of the data we've collected that might assist with your own research and development as well. Our goal is to develop socio-technical solutions. Very complex word, or combine two words together, it sounds even more impressive, but really looking at the technical and the behavioral together. And our opinion is that, that technology is a good start, but when you start looking at insiders who have authorized access to your systems, and you're looking at their normal behavior of accessing data on those systems and technologies, it's hard for technologies to determine malicious intent. So if I work in a bank and I process 100 new customers a day, what if the 88th customer that I process was for a friend or a relative and I do something to their credit history and it's with malicious intent? Can you develop a tool that can do that? Possibly, but right out of the box, many tools aren't designed to identify what was presented before, those anomalies or those differences in a business process or a business transaction. So what we want to present to you is this idea of a program that is enterprise-wide. Most organizations, or at least if you started identifying insider threats, that problem was delegated to the IT department. Develop some type of tool and technology that will identify bad behavior. Well, that is a good start. There are certain things that is pretty clear that we don't want to happen. Data exfiltration off of a cleared or a secured system probably shouldn't happen. That's a technology that could be prevented. But what if we move out to businesses and start identifying things that's part of a normal day-to-day -day activity? What if a business development professional in your organization needs to have data off of your network to interact with customers in the field? How does that tool or technology prevent that from happening? If it does, it's probably preventing your business operation. So here's what we want to challenge organizations that we believe there's a wealth of information across the organization to include information technology, information security, but also think about the non-traditional IT data sources. Those data sources could be your HR department. Again, if I can give you a motive of why people might consider stealing money from you or exfiltrating data off your networks and systems, you might be able to look in your HR department to identify people who may be more at risk. Also think about your non-traditional IT data sources being your physical security departments. You know, everywhere you go, you have to badge in and out. Lots of systems, you can't get in and out of doors without badging in and out. That might be a part of a data source you can start collaborating and coordinating data from to identify someone who's maybe more at risk. So combinations of these observables, someone who's going to leave the organization, who's coming in after their normal working hours, exfiltrating data off of their network, and is visiting websites for job opportunities, four observables across your department that might indicate someone may be leaving and may consider taking data with them to give them a business advantage going on to the next organization. You know, any of those one observables across the department may not raise a flag, but consider combining those together to identify the profile of people and their activity and their impact to potentially your critical assets. So that's a challenge that we want to make to organizations. The challenge then comes with a number of hurdles. Many organizations have silos across their organization. IT has this data, HR has this data, physical security this data, legal and contracting this data. How do we share that across the organization? Here's where I think that your building of an insider threat program might help. Again, we have some recommendations on how you can build a program, how you can communicate, how you can get buy-in across the organization. Again, none of this is foolproof because, again, we don't have one indicator that says, if this, then the insider will do something bad to your organization. But we can give you some guidance on how you can stand up a program. And what this chart looks for is there are certain observables across the timeline that you might want to consider pulling together and I started looking across those non-traditional IT managed data sources. Again, the behavioral aspects is what we believe 
can contribute to identifying someone who may be more at risk. Again, we don't have a key indicator that says will be, but things that might indicate someone may be more at risk. So what our approach to the problem is, we develop these research models. When we present research models in the operational community, people just glaze over. But what this really represents is about 800 to 900 cases that we've built patterns around. We use a formaling modeling technique called systems dynamics modeling. If you're interested, we can bore you to death with the semantics of that. What people really want to see is how we transition that from a research model into something they can take away, something they can apply on their systems. So if we take that research model, what we want to look at is can we develop and derive candidate controls and possibly get to indicators? How does this map out to what you can take away from here? One of the controls that we've re represented, one of the controls that we recommend is if you're concerned about theft of intellectual property, we can give you a possible control that you want to deploy in your systems because we know based upon past incident, who's more likely to steal your IP? When are they more likely to do it? How are the exfiltration methods? And this is what we can develop using a public source tool, an open source tool, a Splunk query that can identify someone who's leaving the organization, accessing a piece of critical information, sending it off your network through email, and it has some type of attachment. This is where we move from just logging information to alerting when something's happening. Again, the goal is logging is usually after the fact reactive. How do you identify when something's happening in real time? This is a control you can deploy, publicly available on our website. Again, Splunk is an open source tool. You can deploy it in your own technology, but we want to give you some insights into how you can configure your tools a little better to reduce that search space a little bit. Again, most organizations log everything, and that's a great thing. Forensics after the facts, so let's go ahead and do that. But how do we move from logging to be a little more proactive and alerting when something's happening? I know that all your organizations are limited in time, resource, money. So again, how do you provide a little better insight into your SOC operators, the NOC operations center, looking at data going across networks? I think we can give you a little bit of insight into what insiders look like and the bad behavior they've done in the past. So in terms of the insider threat, lots of news reports, media comes out is the insider threat. Again, we get a number of media requests to ask us to describe the insider threat. Give us a solution to the insider threat. What we need to be very clear is that there's not one type of insider threat. We want to be very clear that you need to start from the risk profile identifying what you're trying to protect. One of the things that we recommend in CERT is a resilience management model, which identifies four types of assets. Again, this is what people try to protect. They try to protect their people, their information, their technologies and facilities. That's what you want to protect. Organizations should use this to identify what is the higher priority protections. And then based upon that, then you start looking at people who have authorized access to these things, and that helps you prioritize what you're trying to protect. Again, we haven't seen one insider threat. Depending upon who you ask, a threat could be recent cases of Snowden Manning, could go back in history of Hanson Ames. That's one community insider threat. But we start looking at other communities, a banking and finance threat could be someone who steals millions or billions of dollars, that insider. We look at the online retail sales of someone who disables a system, shuts down a website, stops an online retail system. That's a different type of threat. Someone who steals intellectual property, one large organization has a competitor that takes their IP. That's a different type of threat. So in our opinion, there's different threats and should be based upon what you're trying to protect and then who has authorized access to that. So what we want to try to do is to ask organizations to consider this. Separating the target, what are you trying to protect, and what could a person do? A person, again, could be someone in your organization, but it also could be someone outside your organization. So there are threats which are the insider threats, but also external threats. Your risk profile should look at internal and external. What could they do to what you're trying to protect? And then if we specifically look at your insiders, consider a broad perspective. Who do you grant authorized access to those assets? Certainly your employees, consider those as threats. Contractors, subcontractors, suppliers, trusted business partners. And here's where you can start looking at who do we need to watch a little closer based upon who has authorized access to what you're trying to protect. And there we get away from everybody as a threat to everything. Everybody should be watched to the same degree, same sensitivity. In our opinion, you don't have the time, resource, or money to do it. So use this to protect your critical assets and who has authorized access to those critical assets.
insiders are just one threat to your assets, but not everyone is the same threat or equal threats across your organization. So again, that's what we want to try to debunk the myth that everyone's a threat. Let's put these controls and technologies in place that have this big brother type attitude of everyone's being watched, everyone's being reported, everyone should be suspicious. Think about it from a, from a protection strategy, what you're trying to protect and from whom. An insider is only one threat to those critical assets. So consider the malicious insider. We define what the malicious insider is, someone who has intent to do bad. Again, we describe this, we have our definitions when it is working definition, someone who intends to do bad. But also consider the unintentional or the accidental. Again, a number of employees don't intend to harm something, but actually impact your organization's assets. Protection strategy should focus on the asset, and hopefully you can protect from both. Someone who takes their laptop home, loses their laptop, the laptop's stolen, there's probably not malicious intent, but from an organization standpoint, you probably don't care initially, you want to recover from it or protect from the unintentional disclosure, and then if there is malicious intent, we'll involve law enforcement, we'll take the necessary action. So from an information assurance protection standpoint, what are you trying to protect and from whom, and at least initially, you need to consider there could be accidental or non-intentional, but also the, un the uh, malicious as well. If you're interested, we recently released a report on the unintentional insider threat on our website. It goes into some of the patterns, some of the behaviors, some of the contributing factors to why insiders have harmed assets without malicious intent. So I'd certainly recommend our URL will be up at the end. It's a foundational study into the unintentional insider threat, which complements some of the work we have historically done on the malicious insiders. So types of crimes, again, what are you trying to protect? We talked about the information and technology, primarily in facilities. We've divide, divided these into different categories. Sabotaging systems is one type of impact that obviously impacts the availability of systems. Theft of information, again, that will impact the integrity or confidentiality. Fraud, again, usually integrity. And then we do have a number of cases of national security espionage. So again, when someone asks you what is the insider threat, Again, we want you to consider it should be based upon the protection strategies. What are you trying to protect, from whom, and what are the impacts? Therefore, we don't get into one insider threat, which then, then should translate into not one technical solution. Again, if you're trying to protect and make resilient an IT system, that online retail service and system, that's a different strategy from protecting your intellectual property from leaving the organization, which could then imply more than one tool. The defense and depth strategy is still alive and well, to try to prevent or detect suspicious or malicious activity from insiders. So again, hopefully you walk away with here, if nothing else, that there's maybe not everyone's a threat, not everyone can harm everything, but it should be based upon your protection strategy. So very quickly, uh, in the next couple minutes, just want to give you a couple of cases. Again, it's, probably, it's pretty interesting to go through a number of cases. IT sabotage, you know, one particular organization who was managing SCADA systems for offshore oil exploration. So we have this exploration facility out in a water. We have the onshore strategy for protection of that. There was a contractor who was working for an organization that was managing and deploying the wireless communication between onshore and offshore. He applied for permanent, uh, permanent status with the organization that was managing those. He was a contractor. That was denied. He was let go by the contracting organization. What he was able to do because he was disgruntled was to maintain the software that communicated with these offshore facilities and disabled the communication from onshore and offshore. He did that a number of times over a period of years and that was actually in revenge for not being hired by the organization. So what we wanna to give to you is a pattern of IT sabotage that hopefully gives you some clear indication that there is a disgruntlement. Someone in a privileged access area is disgruntled for what they consider a perceived injustice and they shut something down in a revenge for what they did for what was perceived as something being done wrongly against them. A couple other cases very quickly. Financial institutions, we have a number of cases, uh, cases in the financial institutions. A disgruntled system administrator was terminated from the employer on a Friday, went home Friday evening and shut down all of the IT systems for this large financial institution to include all their web access, their online access, remote access, and even walk up ATM facilities. The organization spent the entire weekend recovering from that particular event. A subcontractor at an energy management facility. The contractor actually had a salary dispute with a contractor who was supporting this facility, which did the energy management facility. They actually suspended him on a Friday, but they didn't tell them on a Friday evening. 
He actually still retained the badge for the energy management facility, went in Sunday evening and shut down the energy distribution between a very large part of the U.S. So a dis disrupt the disrupting event with a contractor to contract E relationship, but they didn't tell the organization that he was supporting. So at physical access to the facility, was able to shut down one of the IT systems. An automobile dealer manufacturer laid someone off because of the financial situation. This person was actually managing the vehicle control systems. The IT systems that ran the vehicle control systems, he was terminated from the organization or laid off is a better word. Basically what he was able to do was remain, remain and retain access and actually sent signals to vehicles that were driving down the road. Sort of communicating through their OnStar type devices that were on the systems. Actually disabled some of the ignitions and set off the alarms just randomly for these organizations and these, ve these vehicles which were being managed by very large organizations. And then finally, a security guard. Again, don't disrupt the idea, don't, don't, don't dismiss the idea that someone who has physical access to an area can't harm a system. A security guard at a U.S. hospital gained access to the physical area and did, uh, did something in terms of deploying malicious code on those systems. So systems in the IT systems managed by the hospital, the AC and facilities management, heating and air conditioning, but also patient medications as well. So what, what I want to basically convey to you is that there are ideas that organizations need to consider from IT sabotage. And if I were to ask you a question, are you concerned about it? Many organizations right away might not say yes. But think about the IT systems that if disrupted could cause harm to you and your organization. That's one type of threat you might want to consider when describing the insider threat. So if we compare this to other types of crimes, looking at the data itself, former employees, disgruntled technical positions, they're usually on their way out the door when they deploy their strategies for disrupting the systems, and the impact is usually seen after an organization. So we're asked the question a lot of time, are all insiders disgruntled? If it's in the context of IT sabotage, we have a very high degree of confidence the answer is yes. But we don't have a number of individuals who are disgruntled who, who go on to commit fraud against the organization. Don't have a lot of a high degree of confidence that people are disgruntled will steal your intellectual property. Those are different patterns and those are different motivations on a part of the individuals. So very quickly we'll compare and contrast that to fraud. Fraud is someone stealing money or modifying your data or systems. So if you're concerned about fraud and should you be concerned about fraud, most banks, financial institutions say yes. But what about organizations that manage your employee data? your customer data. A t hard, large target from organization's protection strategy should be your personally identifiable information. What if one of your system administrators downloads your employee database, your customer database? Well, I can tell you there's a market out there for them to sell that for some type of identity theft or credit card fraud. So again, the target protection. If you're in a bank, yes, fraud is clear, stealing of money, but most organizations should also consider protecting your personally identifiable information. PII is a target. Also, it could be if you're in the government, we don't have any type of fraudulent activity. Well, you can't steal money from the government, maybe, maybe not. But think about it from a standpoint of what if you grant benefits? What if you grant payments? What if someone on the outside paid one of your employees to add data to a system or modify data? One particular example we have up here, a Department of Motor Vehicles in the US, actually it was a ring of seven employees, sold more than 200 fake identity documents for over $1 million. Again, that's fraud. The motive is financial gain. Protecting data in systems should be your strategy as well. Protecting data from the external folks, but also from your internal folks as well. So fraudulent activity. Motivation from this is obviously financial gain. Other types of industries that should be concerned, we had accounts payable clerks, so do you do payments? Do you pay vendors, other types of suppliers? We had one particular individual over a period of three years issued 127 unauthorized checks. So is that something you're trying to detect as suspicious or malicious activity? If not, you might want to consider that. Think about a front desk office coordinator. PII is a target or could be a target. Over 1,100 victims of identity theft, over $2.8 million in fraudulent claims. Other cases, a DBA at a very large U.S. insurance company downloaded 60,000 employee records, sold it to someone outside the organization, Again, with the express purpose of identity theft or credit card theft. And then finally, an office manager at a trucking firm added her husband every two weeks to the payroll, paid her husband, check was generated, then removed her husband from the payroll. Over a period of almost a year, losses of over 100K. 
So again, if you're not in a bank or financial institution, do you need to be concerned about fraud? We believe yes. Because again, the target could be the data, unauthorized modification, addition, or deletion of data. Again, that looks different from someone who sabotages systems. People who commit fraud, motivation is money, financial gain. That's different from someone who commits sabotage, disgruntlement. Clearly, we've seen in cases a number of disgruntled employees sabotaging systems. And think about people who have access to your business processes, have access to your PII. Those are the folks you might want to look a little closer at preventing or detecting fraudulent activity. And then finally, theft of IP, same type of question. Do you have intellectual property? Many of you might not categorize it as IP, but there's still confidential or sensitive information that you want to protect. Even in, within the government, there's a lots of data that you don't want to leave your networks or system. Maybe it's not classified at secret or top secret or above, but there might be a wealth of information you want to protect as well from leaving your network. So theft of intellectual property, again, many organizations spend millions or billions of dollars developing IP. Certainly there's clear financial benefit for that not leaving their organization. One particular organization, a research scientist, got a job with a competitor, downloaded 38,000 documents. Sounds like a lot, 38,000. From an organization perspective, they logged every one of those transactions. He left the organization, went to a competitor. It wasn't detected until he started going to work for the competitor. They saw it being uploaded onto their systems. They then contacted the victim organization. When they went back through the logs, they found that this individual was downloading at a rate at 15 times higher than the next highest user at that point in time. So are there technologies that could detect that? Yes. If you're setting thresholds, the answer could be yes. But many organizations, again, are in the reactive logging and can use that after the fact and maybe not alerting when something like that's happening in real time. So just another challenge. What would be considered suspicious in terms of data leaving your network? There's some documents that should never leave, but there's some documents that can leave, but it might be at different times, might be considered suspicious. Other case of theft of IP is 65 gigabytes. Is that a threshold would you consider? 1,300 confidential proprietary documents. Again, 500 million in development costs. And in one particular case which was of interest in terms of national security was a contractor who is managing the simulation software for a major US nuclear power plant resigned from one organization, went to work for a competitor in a foreign country. They started seeing connection requests from the foreign country back to the US at this one particular nuclear power plant. Again, the intellectual property may not be classified as IP, but it was a software. He retained access to the software after he left and had remote access to get back in after the fact. So if we look at theft of intellectual property, that again looks different from the other types of incidents. Intellectual property, we have a window of opportunity. Usually people take it when they're leaving. That might, might not be surprising, but can you configure your system to identify someone who is leaving someone who resigns or is terminated or will be terminated and then start looking about what they're doing on your networks and systems. Again, that first control we talked about in one of the first couple slides might give you some help at trying to identify when information is more likely to leave. So again, we went to the very beginning of the title, best practices for mitigation of insider threats. So I went through that whole 20 minutes of, of my 30 minutes to describe what the threat is as a way to then start tracking what some of the strategies should be for mitigation. Certainly continue to log what you're doing. Certainly that's good, but try to move from continuous logging to more targeted monitoring of that abnormal activity that was talked about in the previous presentation. And can you differentiate between normal and abnormal activity? That would be the challenge. And then try to move from that to be real-time alerting. And here's where I think we can help you with what could be considered suspicious activity based upon what we've looked at and analyzed in terms of the types of incidents. The goal, prevent, hopefully prevent, if not detect as early as possible to minimize the impact. So what I think we can do, and again, I could have went through what we have as a best practice guide. I could have went through our 19 best practices in detail, but without the context of what you're trying to present, pr protect, I think just showing you this list of 19 might have just glazed over. These are specific recommendations that we make to prevent or detect any or all of those types of incidents to you and your organization to also include the unintentional insider threats. So on our website, you can go and download. It's a publicly available document. We're actually in the fourth version of our common sense guide to the mitigation of insider threat. 
This is about an 80-page document that will go through 19 best practices, and really it starts with identifying your critical assets. What are you trying to protect? And then what are you trying to protect from whom? And then here's where then you want to start applying some or all of these best practices. So again, I didn't want to go through all of these. We would have spent most of the time just reading the screen. So I do want to point you to the best practices for mitigation of insider threats. And then people come, have come up to us and said, well, 19, that's too many. Give me a way to prioritize those. So I thought I'd spend the last minute or two talking about prioritizing. How can you prioritize? What do you do first? Obviously, the, if we start from 10 being a priority down to one is the most important. Think about what you've done in the past. Have you had any types of incidents in the past? If so, learn from those. If you're burned once from an employee, okay, shame on, shame on the person. If you're burned twice, shame on me as an organization. So certainly learn from the past. Focus on number nine, protecting your crown jewels. Here's where we, we challenge organizations. When we ask them, when we do assessments of their organization, what are you trying to protect? What's important? Who has authorized access to it? This is where organizations struggle at the very foundation of what they're trying to protect. Certainly think about your current technologies. I would certainly recommend going to our website. We can help you configure your technologies a little bit differently to prevent or detect any or all of those types of incidents we described in the previous 15 minutes. Think about your trusted business partners. Here's a potential weak link from, it, from an organization standpoint. Think about everyone all the way back to your supply chain. Who are you giving authorized access to what you're trying to protect? Again, we have some strategies for that. Think about the concerning behaviors. Think about combining data across your organization. IT, certainly. Physical security, human resources, legal contracting, and think about your business processes as well. There could be data you could pull across the systems to raise a risk level or perception of individuals' threats to your assets. Think about the employees and their potential recruitment. Think about that security awareness training you sit through every year, or it seems like every couple of months that it comes through. Think about it from a standpoint of communicating with your employees what you're trying to protect, and if they are targeted, what their strategy should be. Think about resignation or termination as a key point. That might be a way to reduce your search space a little bit. Think about the also employees impacted by mergers, acquisitions, downsizing, sequestration. You pick the word. People will be impacted by certain events the organization does. You might want to consider watching those folks a little closer. Certainly address employee privacy issues with general counsel, the privacy and legal issues. Make sure you start with them before implementing the programs, work across your organization, and then certainly create an insider threat program as soon as possible. So with that, I'd like to just leave this CERT resource list up here. Our, or our website is CERT.org, insider underscore threat. The best practices for mitigation are available, information about workshops or assessments, the control work. We have a number of publicly available controls certainly the exercises and other training opportunities. And also, if you're interested, again, it was, as was mentioned, I am a co-author. What we try to do is pull all of our research from the previous 10 years into one concise source, being the CERT Insider Threat Guide to the Mitigation of Theft, Sabotage, and Fraud. So with that, uh, I might have gone through my entire 30 minutes to not allow for questions. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I'd be, I'm here all day, so I'd be glad to talk to you during lunch or the breaks and talk about anything. And maybe take one question or two questions. Sure. Sure. Uh, Please. I've got to get to some VBMs. I really have two questions. Sure. So the first one is over your 850 cases, um, have you seen any, can you summarize any trends that may have come out since 2007 in terms of insider threat tactics or indicators or observables that may play out? The yeah, second, okay. second question sure. is um, so um, there's Okay, so to, to address the first question in terms of recent trends or patterns, uh, as we look across the number of cases we've collected over the years, again, it goes back from 1995 to the present, so you know, certainly a, a wealth of, of timelines and periods, we certainly see a, a more in terms of the reporting. It's certainly interesting from a standpoint, it, it, it's, it we're hypothesizing that the number of rules and regulations, federal, state, and local requirements to report these breaches, these impacts to organizations, representing these incidents to shareholders certainly see a, a higher degree of reporting, which traditionally we, we saw a number of organizations reluctance to report. But we're seeing that only in certain areas. If you start looking at the financial communities or the health or HIPAA or even payment card, certain industry have rules and regulations for reporting incidents. 
but many organizations don't fall in those sectors. So we certainly do believe that it's getting better in terms of reporting or prosecution, but also we're seeing that there are certain industries that because they're not required to report or disclose an incident or a breach or an impact, they're not being required. So some industry we're seeing better trends at reporting, others we're still not. And then to go to your second question, the second question specifically, remind me again. Uh, this was APT1. Oh, okay, yeah, the advanced persistent threat. So from our standpoint, what we wanna to try to do is where an insider is involved in an APT type attack, whether they be intentionally involved to grant someone outside authorized access in, or they're social engineered, or they're not most, most intent, grant authorized access. If that's a case where we've seen APT come in through an individual, we can tie it to an individual, then we would have cases in our database. In those particular incidents, we've seen that there is a clear pattern that once inside the networks and systems, the people who have authorized access tend to look a lot, a lot like what the individuals are in the networks. They tend to take the amount of time that's needed to look across the network, to look for the data, but from an APT perspective, without that knowledge of where to go specifically for those critical assets, we see a lot of more exploratory into trying to dis discover where the assets are as opposed to a direct beeline to the critical assets where an insider has that knowledge. So there might be a lot more experimental or probing, uh, in our opinion or hypothesis, and not necessarily a direct beeline to where that asset is because that knowledge gives them insight and they don't have to explore and go beyond what they need to know or the control is. So, very good question. Okay. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, so Did we have any online things there yet, Tom? No. Okay. I would certainly be glad to take questions offline, maybe to yeah, keep you sure. on the schedule. Yeah, yeah, just uh, we're, we're, we're about five minutes behind at this point. Okay. Jack, did you have a quick one? Okay. Is that good or bad? <laughs> okay. I can, I can certainly, we can certainly give you lots of technologies that could help. I would, I would say that the business process and planning is not more important, but it should be considered as well. Many organizations that we've talked to are deploying tools, and the tools are doing something, but it's not identifying the anomalous activity. And without the ability to differentiate regular or normal from anomalous, that's where the tools are just collecting data and not necessarily alerting on uh, what is potentially suspicious activity. I honestly, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, we've been doing this research and publishing these reports for going on 13 years. We work with a number of organizations in the government, both large federal, state, and local government. We work with academia, and we've made recommendations in terms of tools and technologies that could be deployed, combining with the business planning, business process, uh, to identify what could be ways to prevent or detect suspicious activity. So to answer your question, I don't know if anyone's truly adopted all 19 as a strategy. There are certainly ones that could be applied or applied at different organizations. Our goal is to raise awareness to the problem and hopefully give some insights into the strategy for prevention and detection. Okay. Thanks, Thank Randy. You. Sure. Appreciate it very sure. much. Thank you. Okay.